you know, something called an interest coverage ratio, which is basically your EBIT earnings for interest and taxes over your interest expense is already falling precipitously. And that's before this great debt reset happens in 2024 and 2025. Now, you say, well, maybe we don't have to worry about that until 2025. I think that's going to start getting priced into the market very soon, as in like Q4 of this year and early in 24. Because everybody knows about this maturity. This is not, you know, Goldman Sachs put out a report about this debt maturity wall coming. So it's coming. It's reality. And when you have 10% of companies out there as zombies, in other words, they can't even pay, uh, they have to borrow money to pay interest on debt. That's what it, that's the definition of a zombie. They don't have the cash flow from operations to pay interest on debt. What do you think is going to happen to those companies? And they and there's about 11 million people employed in the United States of, of, of America. 11 million people employed in these junk-rated, high-yield corporate debt businesses. Wow. They're, I, they're, I did not for know a that. Real that. Shock. Yeah, I did not know that stat. So we've obviously yeah. talked about the risk of zombie companies on this program before. Um, and I guess I just sort of thought, I should have thought to try to dig up that data point. But yeah, yeah, yeah. we start having, you know, contagion amongst the zombie fleet as they are forced to, to um, you know, go out and refinance as their existing loans come up for maturity. They're, you know, in many cases going to die or on the process of dying are going to have to shed costs, meaning cut jobs, right? Either one of those examples is putting those 11 million jobs in jeopardy. So, you know, this historically low unemployment rate that's super resilient and everybody points to is keeping us out of, uh, you know, out of recession, that could jump pretty high, pretty fast once those those loans for the zombie companies start uh, re-rating. Not only zombies, it's like I said, high yield and junk, they're, they're different, but the high yield companies, junk rated companies, they're not really, de by definition, have to be zombie companies. No, you're right. You're right. So, so think about that. So let's continue on if you don't, if you don't mind. Yeah. And actually, sorry, before we do, but I just, I just want to toss this out there because when you were talking, it reminded me of this. Um, you remember leading up to the global financial crisis, leading up to the, the bursting of the housing bubble. I remember seeing these charts published by um, CS at uh, First Boston, you know, Credit Suisse First Boston. And it was projecting out the amount of, of ARM mortgages mm -hmm. that were going to have to come up for re-rating. Right. right? And yeah. you just saw this massive tsunami coming in the future. And guys like you and I would look at this and, and say, oh my gosh, there's going to be a massive reckoning in the housing market. But nobody cared. Well, because, they've been, because they've been packaged into these pooled mortgages, which, you know, housing prices have never gone down in the United States ever in the history of ever. <laughs> so yeah. what can go wrong? Because you take a real crappy mortgage and put it in a pool of other okay mortgages and, you know, hey, the lowest tier tranche might go bad, but that doesn't mean anything else is going to go bad. But we saw the domino effect, what happens. You know, this is, this is a story that's played out over and over again. What gets you in trouble is over leveraged economies. The United States is a very over leveraged economy, and there's a much, much higher interest rate on that leverage coming very, very soon. Very, very. Okay, great. So you're sort of underscoring my point, which is sort of like, we've seen this movie before. <laughs> uh, we can see these, these, uh, these maturity, this maturity wall coming. Um, I'll put up a chart right here while we're talking, Michael, that um, has come uh, surfaced on this channel a couple of times of late, but it shows the amount of corporate debt that is coming up for maturity in the next couple of years. And, and uh, I'm doing it from me uh, memory, but folks who can see the chart on the screen can see the actual numbers. But I think it was like, 600 something billion this year uh it goes up into the higher you know getting kind of close to a trillion next year 2025 it's over a trillion so it is a big wave coming but it seems like you know history repeats and rhymes right like we we, we have this over leveraged system but it seems like we still have this hubris right now that for somehow it's just not gonna matter but obviously you're yeah. saying it will and just to tie up a, a little bit of a loose end here too. You know, I knew, I said that these banks were going to be in trouble in 2023. And how did I know that? Well, um, everybody was saying that what was the mollifying effect this time around was that, hey, corporations locked in very low rates forever. 
Um, mortgages have been locked in at 3% 30-year fixed forever. Not a problem, right? No problem at all. But I, you, know, I, you know, you learn in, you know, everything has an equal and opposite reaction. For every action, there's an, it's one of the laws of thermodynamics, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, so who is, but who owns all this debt is what I asked myself. Who owns all of this debt? Who owns the mortgage-backed securities, the commercial mortgage-backed securities, the junk debt that's yielding nothing? Well, it's banks. It's the shadow banking system. It's the Silicon Valley banks and the first republics of the world. These are the banks that are loaded with this with this garbage. And their, their prices tanked and yields skyrocketed for this mm -hmm. debt. And they ended up sending to the Fed through their bank term funding program, all of that debt at par for a year. Within Now they have March, the middle of March, the Ides of March 24. We'll talk about this too. We have so much to talk about. What's Powell going to do? Now, now, the bank term funding program is like a hybrid of the discount window. Normally, the discount window is open for about three months. You, you give your distressed debt, mostly treasuries. <laughs> That's how it was intended in 1913. That's the only thing the Fed was allowed to buy. You give your underwater treasuries, your assets, to the discount window, the Federal Reserve. They give you a loan with a haircut for three months. The BTFB is a loan for a year at par value. But what happens at the point when we get to the middle of March 2024? Powell has to make a very big decision. Am I going to permanently monetize this debt and take it off the bank's balance sheets like QE would do? Mm -hmm. Because you're going to hand you're going to hand a bank or a shadow bank their treasuries and mortgage-backed securities that are a fraction of the cost, even what they were when they took them off their hands. And then the, the banks owe the Fed par value, full value for these assets. That's, that's going to be a huge problem. So, you know, again, uh, I'm sure I'll mention this in, the, in this interview. You can't just sit there and pontificate on what you're going to do in March of 2024. A lot of this depends because the entire economy and market is artificial. This, the, the free market is dead. So we have to we have to be on you know bated breath. We are waiting on bated breath for Powell to decide what he's going to do with the bank term funding program. Is he going to roll it over, allow them to roll over this debt endlessly, and then then it becomes QE. Right. And I would I would submit to you that my my trading decisions will change greatly based upon what he does. About But his I, decision. I, I, it's a big decision, and I, I, I don't hear anybody. You know, he didn't talk about it, Jackson Hole. When he went out out there for his pose to look for mooses and uh, and bear, <laughs> I mean, why didn't anybody ask him, uh, Mr. Powell? What are you going to do with the bank term funding program that's keeping all these banks afloat and alive? 